Well, welcome back to our Read Through the Bible, and today we are picking up in the book of Joshua. Now, let's remember that the book of Joshua begins a new stage in the Bible, the conquest stage. Now, remember this. The first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis describes the creation stage. Chapters 12 through 50 describe the patriarchal stage, the period Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob's 12 sons. And then the first chapter of the book of Exodus describes the Egyptian experience. Then Exodus chapter 2 through the end of the book of Deuteronomy describes the Exodus period itself. And then as we come into Joshua chapter 1, we are coming into the conquest stage of the Bible. Now, this is also the first of the 12 historical books. Joshua has been commissioned back in Numbers 27 by Moses to take his place and be the one that actually leads the children of Israel into the promised land. Remember, Moses will die on Mount Pisgah, the top of Nebo, and he will not go into the promised land. The word Joshua literally means Jehovah saves. It's an Old Testament form of the New Testament word Jesus. Joshua has an interesting life. He is born in Egypt. He serves as a servant, a soldier, a spirit-filled man, separated to God. Joshua is a very interesting individual. And Joshua does not actually become the leader of Israel. He does a lot of things to, to assist Moses and, and to help Moses. But he doesn't actually become the leader of Israel. He's 90 years old. He's going to die at the age of 110. So if you ever feel like you're kind of getting older and you haven't been used of God, look at the example of Joshua. Now, in the book of Joshua, there's a key word, possess. Take the land. And there's another key phrase that is very important. Be strong, courageous. I'm calling you to take the land, be strong and courageous. Because you remember what happened at Kadesh Barnea 38 years earlier. They did not possess the land, and they were not strong and courageous. So at any rate, let's jump into Joshua chapter 1. Here in Joshua chapter 1, Joshua receives a charge from God. Now, he's already been commissioned by Moses, as we talked about just a moment ago. But God commissions Joshua Take the land. No one will be able to stand before you. I will be with you. Again, be strong, courageous. Only be very strong, courageous. Over and over again, this is repeated. That Joshua should be strong, courageous. Trust the Lord his God. The book of this law shall not depart from your mouth. Do all that is written in it. Obey my word. Follow my word. Sound familiar? That is the key to success. And then down about verse 10 through 15, it talks about God telling Joshua, prepare the people to go in. Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe Manasseh, they will go first. Remember, this is back, Moses said that these tribes, which have their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan River, had to lead the assault to the west side of the Jordan River. All Israel will be involved. And then the leaders and all the people responded to Joshua and said, we will obey all your commands if anybody doesn't follow your commands. That person will be put to death. The only thing we want from you, Joshua, is to be strong and courageous. What an incredible scene. Too bad this couldn't continue in Israel. Well, in chapter 2, you have the story of Rahab and the spies. Now remember, Joshua sends out two spies to spy out uh, the land, and in particular, the area around Jericho. And so they go into uh, Jericho, spy out the land, Rahab takes them in. Now, we don't know who these spies are. I will just say this for a moment. There's some speculation based on the genealogy found in Matthew chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, that one of those spies may have been named Salmon, because here you have the story of how a man named Salmon marries a woman named Rahab, which is obviously, I believe, um, Rahab here in uh, second chapter of Joshua, and becomes the father of Boaz. Boaz, very interesting, because Boaz becomes the father of Obed by Ruth the Moabite. So you have a Canaanite woman and a Moabite woman in the genealogy of Jesus here in Matthew chapter 2. So, anyway, Rahab takes the spies in, um, and Rahab hides them, and the king of Jericho gets word that there are some spies because they are scared to death of Israel. They have heard what has taken place so much earlier with the crossing of the Red Sea and how they defeated the two Amorite kings, Sihon and Og, and, and they're just scared to death 
of the Israelite horde that is coming in, to use the words of Balak, the king of Balaam. So at any rate, Rahab, when uh, men come and say, hey, are there spies here? She lies about it. The Bible never condones lying, but it tells what she did. So she hid them under some flax, winds up letting them down the city wall. Remember, where she lived was in the city wall. Very important uh, when Jericho is destroyed. So anyway, any rate, she told the men of the city, go look for them. So they go to the, towards the Jordan River. She lets the spies down, tells them to go west in the hill country in the opposite direction. And then after three days... When they're back in the city, you leave and go back across the Jordan River, go home. And they did it. And she also said something. She said, when you come and take over the, the land and you take over Jericho, defeat Jericho, deal kindly with my family. And so they said, yeah, okay, we will do this. You put a scarlet thread pointing at the point of Jesus Christ and what he did for us in the window. Bring your family into the house um, and remain in there, and if they leave, you know, they're not going to make it, and, and, and we're not responsible for that. But if they stay in, and you are faithful and don't turn us in, you know, then we will do this, which she upheld her part of the bargain, and of course, Israel will upheld their part of the bargain. So they come back um, across the river, the spies do. They say, hey, they're terrified us. We need to go. Why did they do that 38 years earlier in Kedesh Barnea? Well, chapter 3 describes the crossing, how they cross. Um, they follow the Ark of the Covenant, keep a distance of 3,000 feet. The priests stand in the river. God dries up the water of the Jordan River from a city called Adam in the north all the way to, uh, to the Dead Sea in the south. And as the priests stand in the river and the water is dried up, when they put their, the soles of their feet, it dried up. When they stand in the middle of the river, 12 men get 12 stones out of the river and they take it over to Gilgal. They also set up a second memorial in the river itself, but let's concentrate on the one in Gilgal, the new encampment. They're led, first of all, by 40,000 men from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe Manasseh. Remember, Moses said, you will go first into the land. And they come over into the promised land. Uh, their new encampment here in chapter 4 is in Gilgal. Now, it's fascinating in chapter 4. Again, I'll say the 40,000 men go over. Um, there are 600,000 men altogether, uh, and the 40,000 represent the shock troops of the two and a half tribes. So you have this massive tribe. And actually, of these two and a half tribes, there's actually something like 100,000. But I believe what you have is 40,000 of them will act as the leadership troops. And you'll see this in particular after the Battle of Jericho, after the Battle of Ai, in kind of the southern campaign, I think they're going to take some leadership there, or I believe it's at least implied there in the Bible. Um, some people will say, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, that some of them remained back on the east side of the Jordan River, some of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. I don't believe that because they're obedient to the Bible. The Bible speaks of them all going over. So um, I think that's very clear, and I think that's the explanation of that. Well, uh, they pile the stones up, and God tells them, your God has brought you through the Red Sea, the Jordan River. And whenever your sons see this, they will know that all the world is to fear the Lord because these stones are to remind them what they mean. Memorials are very important in the Bible, especially in, in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. Well, um, uh, they get over to Gilgal. They circumcise themselves. They had been ignored in the wilderness for 40 years. The generation that came out of Egypt had been circumcised, going back to Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 through 14. But they circumcise themselves. Uh, kind of they disable the whole army for a few days. They recover at Gilgal, um, and they observe the Passover on the 14th day of the month, the 14th of Abib, the first day of the year. Forty years. Remember, they left uh, Egypt after the observance of the Passover and the death angel passed over where the blood was and all of Egypt were burying their, their dead as they watched the, Egypt, the, the Israelites leave Egypt. Well, anyway, they, they observed Passover. Uh, the next day, they ate the produce of the land. The manna ceased, and chapter 5 describes that in detail. Well, chapter 6, we come to the story of Jericho itself. So God gives some specific instructions of how this battle is to be fought. Um, you're to march around the city six times 
uh, excuse me, one time a day for six days. They'll march around the city once a day for six days. And they had an order. You would have um, the forward guard, the army in the front, and then you'd have seven priests with the seven ram's horns. Then you would have the Ark of the Covenant. Then you'd have the rear guard. So they march around Jericho uh, six times each day. They'd march around the city for six days, one time each day. Let me get this right. They'd march around the city one time each day for the first six days, and then march around it in silence, okay? As, as far as the people are silent, okay? Okay, on the seventh day, they'll march around it seven times, and when you hear the long blast of the ram's horn on the seventh day, the people finally get to shout, and when they shout, the walls of Jericho will come down. Now, it's interesting that in Jericho, everything was under the ban. Men, women, young, old, ox, sheep, donkey. You know, this is supposed to be under the ban, and no one is to take um, what is there. All the, the gold and the silver and all of that is supposed to go in the treasury. Everything that's living is to be killed. You see this ban. Well, and then remember Rahab? Rahab was faithful. Her family saved. They live outside the camp. So next chapter, you get to chapter 7, and there's a little place called Ai up there. And so, you know, they kind of spy that out. Oh, just a few people uh, up there, and it won't be hard to take. So let's just take two or 3,000, and we'll fight the battle. They didn't consult God, but they went up against battle. Uh, a number of them, 36, are killed. They come back. Joshua, distraught, tears his clothes. What will we do? And God reveals to him there is sin in the camp. And I'm not going to bless you as long as there's sin. Well, you know the story. They bring all Israel by lot. They find the tribe of Judah. They go to the family of the Zerahites. They, they cast these lots. Finally, it lands on Achan. Achan stole the Babylonian garment he took silver, he took gold, they found it in his tent. They take him, his family, his animals, everything he has down the valley of Achor, stone him, burn it, cover it with stones, and God removed the reproach. You know, the holiness of God jumps out at you over and over and over again in the Bible. So, at any rate, um, chapter 8, and actually, remember, they're killed and buried in the Valley of Acor. The Valley of Acor meant trouble. You know, and the, the heap of stones, again, is kind of a memorial reminding us of God. Well, you can come into Joshua chapter 8. Uh, the Lord gives specific instructions for how they will take Ai. Uh, they actually use an ambush. They put 30,000 men behind it. Then Israel comes forward. Then the men of Ai come out. Then they burn the city. All 12,000 of the people in Ai are killed. Now, at the end of uh, chapter 8, verses 30 and following, you have a scene here where they build an altar in on Mount Ebal. Mount Ebal and Gerizim are two mountains that are side by side. Uh, Mount Ebal to the north is the Mount of Cursing, and Mount Gerizim to the south is the Mount of Blessing. And what it means here is, in, in fulfillment of what God had instructed them back in the book of Deuteronomy, um, that they were to build an altar here on Mount Ebal, and half of the tribes would be divided on one side, half on the other, and here they were to recite the blessings and the curses. And this fulfillment, they're doing what Moses said back in Deuteronomy uh, here. And, and it's interesting, one thing more about this altar they built, this altar is built, and they covered it with lime plaster, and they wrote on the altar the entire law of God. Again, how important it is to know God's Word. Well, as we close this first eight chapters of the book of Joshua, let me remind you, read God's Word. You need to know God's Word. It is so important. My people, the prophet Hosea will say, are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Read the Bible, and you will get a blessing. God bless you, and read the Bible.